Okay. Okay. Okay, so can you guys hear me? Okay, so the first question I'd, I'd like to ask goes to uh, Ms. Wilson. Ms. Wilson, could you explain to us what did separate and equal mean when you were growing up, and how did the African American community feel about Sheriff Wyatt? I mean, or how did women feel about Sheriff um, <clears throat> I. I was, um, I was, let me just say, I was born in 1931 in Greensboro, Green County, and everything there was separate and equal. That was the term that the law at that time. So I went to the um, public school, which was um, separate. And as you can see on the uh, slides there, this, my school was a one-room schoolhouse. It was in the very rural part of the county. And um, it was built by my family. There were no schools not in that part of the county for African American students. Mm -hmm. My parents, especially my father and grandfather and the men of the community, wanted to make sure that their children had some amount of education. The land was donated to the community in about 18, 76 to build a church. So we had in each of the little communities where we live a church and then the schoolhouse and then the cemetery. So my dad and the rest of the males there built the schoolhouse. So um, we had one, one room schoolhouse and one teacher. And the teacher, because I was one of the younger children that started the school, uh, I got a chance to ride in the horse and buggy with the teacher. Wow. So that was a good time. Because uh, my brother, I had two older brothers, and they were, um, <coughs> legs was long, and they could walk faster than me. And my dad didn't trust uh, me ever walking by myself. So Miss Smith taught the small kids on one side of the room and the larger kids and older kids on the other side. There was never ever any discipline problem. We didn't even know what that word was. <laughs> it was I think it was called you better behave yourself. <laughs> Department. You uh, but that was, um, until I was about third grade. And during the Roosevelt administration, after the depression, after the Bow Weaver and all, uh, the Rosenwald schools was being built and then there were uh, the schools and I, I honestly don't remember the name who built the next school I went to, which was called the Alexander Center. What I do remember is the name Alexander was one of the people who was responsible for passing the legislation to build uh, public school buildings in the South for African American mm -hmm. students. And so this was like a big building. Actually, it's four rooms. But it was like a um, um, school where not only did they teach the students, but they taught the parents. So we learned how to can, we learned how to um, preserve, we learned homemaking skills. And so the students was mostly, you know, they, they, um, they are in the, um, morning and the parents would come in the evening. I, it was 
the way of life for me there. We never had occasion when I was growing up to have any event with the white students. We just knew that they had a school. We knew that they had a gym. We knew they had the buses. Mm -hmm. We also knew that they had all of the new equipment. And we had all of the hand-me-down, including when they built the new school for us, we still got the hand-me-downs. And so that's what I grew up with, that's what I knew. And uh, I, I couldn't believe when um, Al, um, the young man who worked at Ivory Way Cafe, kept saying, don't you know Miss Hersler? She, she came from Greensboro. She knows <laughs> Shaf Wire. You came from Greensboro. You know Shaf Wire? And I'm like, I know who Shaf Wire is because he was the Shaf. And I was scared to death of him. I only thought that Shell White locked up all black people. And I didn't know nothing about the moonshine capital of Georgia until I read Clara's book. And, um, but that's the way life was for me. And, and we were happy. So I didn't need to say that. It wasn't like we sat around and said, well, it's me. But also, we were taught that, um, you know, look for bigger and better things in your life. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. it can be better and it will be better. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up with that uh, in a loving family with uh, loving parents, grandparents, and all. It was, um, to me, Claire, I, I do want to say this. To me, Claire. At All Way Cafe, the first time you guys met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the first. It was the first time that I had met a person from Greene County, Georgia, that lived there her life. I lived there my life, well, I guess you left when you went off to school. I left when I became 18 and moved to Decatur. But we had never met, and I had never met another white person to sit down and have a conversation, never. Wow. So it was like, OK, OK, Al, <laughs> OK, <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> I'm, going, I'm, I'm, ready. I'm ready. So last year, we, we met at Ivory Way Cafe and had lunch. And, and it was so different of her growing up in Greene County, Georgia, and my growing up in Greene County, Georgia. We were not that far apart, mm -hmm. I mean, a few miles right. apart. But and the, at the same time. At the same time. Can you tell us about the the, mo the whole moonshine when Sheriff Wyatt knocked on your door? Okay, well, she, I'm trying to get my Okay, she said to me about an incident that happened um, at, when I was growing up. I was probably, I was somewhere 14, 15 years old, and we lived in the section of town called Canaan. And, um, my father, we were no longer living on the farm. My father had gotten a job driving the truck, the Parkwood truck. And so he had access to this truck all of the time. And so the, the owners of the moonshine steel were the white owners. There were no black owners who owned the steel. The black men, and they were mostly men who did this, they were labeled as the runners. So they got the moonshine, the jugs, <laughs> and got them out of Cary Station. And that's a community that I'm familiar with there. And so all of the black men were the ones who was arrested. Right. So that was my experience right. with that. So one evening, one of the runners had gotten 
away or had disappeared. And Shell Wyatt was looking for him. And because my father was one of the few people who had access to a truck, he ended up at our house. Now, I grew up in a Christian family, and my daddy was big in the church. And naturally, all of us had to go to church every Sunday. And, uh, and I'm like, let me hurry up and get grown so I won't have to go to church every Sunday and stay all day. But, but Chef White ended up at our house. Now, I think what's not showing up here is I live in a little shotgun house. Now, some of y'all know what shotgun houses is. Let me see your hand. Shotgun house, people. Okay. So in the shotgun house, and it was nine of us, and so we had two beds in every room. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, when Shelf Wyatt came, knocked on the door, my daddy came to the door, greeted him, he wanted to come in, and of course daddy <clears throat> let him in, and he just came in and pulled the cover back to see who was actually in the bed. Mm. I was a teenager and I was not just scared, but I was scared to death mm -hmm. yeah. of that incident, which yeah. stayed with me. So I, I, when I read Clara's book, I'm glad that he was able to do some things that people saw different uh -huh. than what I saw. But my experience yeah. was, is this really what the chef, yeah. is he not just the chef, but he, the bully for black people and the runners. So. Mm -hmm. And I, I, he was still a chef when I left, but um, life was um, difficult, my growing up, because everything was so separate there. I never went into several of the stores and now we're not talking about Atlanta. So we're talking about Greensboro, Georgia, where they had one traffic light and a store on each corner. But I never put foot in to what was called Hunter's Drug Store until Tiffany and um, we went down to do the filming years later. Okay, this question is directed to Ms. Hersler. Ms. Hersler, when you interviewed uh, blacks and whites, what were some of the memorable things they said about Sheriff White? Some of the memorable, <coughs> funny, antidote stories. Well, one story is um, <clears throat> that a woman told me was, uh, no, she didn't tell me, but one story in the book is about a woman <coughs> who was a moon, moon she sold moonshine. And um, Wyatt went to, Wyatt was known for warning people. Usually he warned people before he arrested them because he got tired of arresting them and running after them. And he, he decided to start telling people, you know, I had a dream last night that you were doing moonshine. And if you are, you better stop because you know I'm going to get you. So they would stop because they knew he would get them. So he went to one house one day and he saw this smoke behind the house. And he knew full well what it was, but he said to her, um, Daisy, what? it looks like I see some smoke back there behind your house. Um, uh, looks like it's coming up off your property. He said, uh, next time I come by here, if it's still doing that, I'm gonna have to go down that road and see what that is. So she said, that white hadn't left my house good before I was out there tearing down that moonshine still. <laughs> because she knew he would do what he said, but he gave people, that was one of the common threads, was it how much he warned people um, to make his own job easier. Uh, another story is that um, one woman told me how much he protected. She was a black woman and she told me, I had a, spent a long time with her. And she told me how, he, what a father he was to her and how he protected her so many times from her ex-husband who 
would beat up on her and um, how much she really respected him. And he told her one time, you keep running from him, why don't you get a divorce? And she said, I went out and got one because that's what Wyatt recommended. Oh. And, and many of them said he listened to them when no one else would. Now, I'm not saying these things to negate what her, uh, Elizabeth's experience was because that would be frightening to anybody. Even if it wasn't the sheriff, but if it was the sheriff wide, it would be. But um, um, the, his only child, Sonny, was in the hospital, and he said that someone came to the door, knocked on his door, and said, and he told him to come in. And the woman came in, who came in was a, an African American woman, and she said, Mr. Sonny, you don't know me, and I don't know you, but my mama knew your daddy. And that was one good man. She said, um, when my daddy was, a, was an alcoholic and when he died, uh, Mr. White, Sheriff White came to the funeral. And afterward, he sat down and spent an hour listening to my mama. And my, my, my preacher didn't even do that. And she said, I just had to tell you that and thank you. So you get, you, you know, I guess individuals and I had different experiences, but mm -hmm. what, what, what um, Elizabeth had, any of us would have been really traumatized by, I think. To both of you guys, Ms. Hersler and Ms. Wilson, what are some of the values and principles that you learned growing up in rural Georgia that we need to bring back today or that we lost? good old-fashioned values or eating, anything that you can share with us that, that, that we could uh, learn. Like for instance, I know you guys didn't eat with preservatives. You probably, everything was probably all home cooked. Fresh. <laughs> Fresh. We grew everything. Grew everything. Oh, one thing. Growing up, <clears throat> growing up in, in our house, uh, like I said, my, my parents were parents of nine children, and it was always room for one more. So if somebody was out um, and needed a place to sleep tonight, mm -hmm. uh, Lord knows we didn't have anywhere for them, but my mother made sure that she pulled out a quilt that she had quilted and made a pallet. Mm -hmm. In case y'all don't know what a pallet is, <laughs> it's that you sleep on the floor and you're under this wonderful handmade quilt, and, but you're not outside. And you always had something to eat. And, and until I was grown with children who had graduated from college, I was never, in a house by myself. My daughter had graduated <laughs> from UGA, and all of a sudden I realized, there's nobody in my house. I, I, it's quiet, what is this? So it was always somebody at our house. It was, always, it was, it was an open door, we shared. If, if the neighbor had a difficult time with their crops or their garden, we shared, always. We, we, we went to church. We, I mean, they practiced what they preached. And we knew, respect your mother and your father. Mm -hmm. Or you respect the adults. Mm -hmm. My aunt is a few years older than me, until she died a few years ago, I was still calling her Aunt Ruby. <laughs> and, and she didn't like it so much because she died. It makes me feel old, yeah. well tough, because your sister said that this one, the rest of us had to call you Aunt, mm -hmm. we could not address you. And it was something about the family life mm -hmm. that was family life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you guys got to eat cane syrup. Yes. We, made, we grew everything. Uh, we grew everything. Talking about preservatives, we didn't know what that was. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have fast food places because we grew everything. 
uh, included making the syrup that uh, we had to go with. The, we didn't have pancakes, we had biscuits and butter. And which we churned ourselves. Which we churned ourselves, right? And then we took the milk from that and had buttermilk and that was another whole meal. One so, of the, excuse me, one of the things that was so exciting for both of us, I think, was that we learned that even though we were on separate farms, we did many things alike. Mm -hmm. And we grew, like I was- Like hog killing day. Yeah, hog killing day. And, I, <laughs> and I, I didn't go into some of the stores in Greensboro that she mentioned, not because I couldn't, because I was of the color that could have gone in, but we didn't have any money. There wasn't any need for me to go in there. I couldn't buy a Coca-Cola. So I think I was 14 years old before I ever tasted a Coke because, and that was when I came to Athens to the hospital to see my father who had just had surgery and, and I got sick of just being in a hospital and somebody bought me a Coke. Um, so we, we uh, just like Elizabeth, we grew everything we had chickens, eggs, um, sausage, uh, and, I, and, um, uh, and uh, ha ham, fresh hams, and sauce, smoked sausage, and um, um, we, we, ground, we ground up T-bone steaks to make hamburgers. What? Canned. We canned and froze. And it was um, very special to can because the ladies would see how many cans that they could do a year. So they made it be a contest. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. So we had every vegetable that known yes. uh, was grown. My daddy was very good. I mean, if he planted a seed, it grew, and it grew something that you could eat. Wow. And, and so uh, they had hundreds of cans mm -hmm. of vegetable, and then we learned how to do the, at the Alexander Center, we learned how to to can with the can. That was my first time. Oh, with the, the tin cans. cans. The tin cans. Yeah. Oh, you mean the tin cans. We, the tin cans. we had a cannery come to Green County um, to, in our later years, and so people would, my family too, we, you would go up and um, take your produce there, and um, the, you could can it there, and they would seal it for you. So you had, you had better luck. <laughs> um, so some of the other things that um, she didn't mention about rural life is that I guess she did mention that we, we, we didn't have a recycle, we wore it out. Mm -hmm. So we had nothing to recycle. And um, we, we made things last. And I, I don't want you to cry when I tell you this, but we didn't have much candy in my house. Occasionally my mother would get some money to get us some, or my aunt would bring us some. And my mother, because there were eight of us, would um, give us a piece that day, and she would parcel it out. She would hide it so we couldn't find it. And then the next day, she would give us another piece. So we learned to savor the food and to make it last. And So you won't find me binging on sweets today because I learned to, to savor it. But uh, one other thing, um, we would, um, we learned, my sister and I learned to sew our own clothes through the 4-H club. And um, one of the things, values, that I find really, really good from rural life is that everybody in the family, because you were in a large family, everybody had a role. Everybody knew that they had a special place in that family. And everybody knew that they had tasks to do. So you didn't have kids sitting around bored wondering what to do next. We all knew what we had to do next. And um, so looking back over it, you might not like it at the time, but you realize that you had a place and you had a family like Elizabeth mentioned, <laughs> that you, you had a place to belong, yeah. yeah. And then, um, and we had extended families too, as she has mentioned. We had a lot of uncles and aunts that didn't have children. Some of them were married and some were single, but they didn't have children. So they were always like, um, maybe they would buy shoes for us or clothes, make clothes for us. 
but they mostly would encourage us. And as um, somebody um, evidently has spent some time with Elizabeth and with me to encourage us, or we wouldn't have become who we are today. So Absolutely. I feel like a lot of mine was from school teachers, from people at my church, which was small, and from my fa extended family. And we were homeless when the tornado hit my house. And we were homeless for, I don't remember how long, several weeks or months while my father um, arranged another house. And so we just went and lived with our uncles and aunts. And uh, that doesn't happen much today, I think. Okay. 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 Any, uh, this concludes our discussion part. Do you, is, are there any questions anybody have? Any, okay, yes. Um, Ms. Ritzler, were you surprised when you heard about Ms. Tillerson's experiences, considering you said you interviewed about 30 people or so for your book? Um, were you surprised to hear that her experience wasn't? Yes, I was. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you one thing, I wanted to say this anyway. I just really appreciated, as she has mentioned, it was really neat for me to sit down with an African-American who was not angry, but who could really talk and listen. And we listened to each other and we hope that we, now the holiday's are over and this program is over, that we will spend more time together. But, um, but I was surprised um, that he, I don't know if I was surprised that he went into the house because I think White would have done that with a white family too. I don't think it had to do with, I don't think that, but I can see where uh, an African-American community would think that. Um, given, given all the other stories I heard about him, but I was surprised that um, beyond that, uh, Liz, you, I'm speaking for you, but you, she told me that that she didn't have a feeling that he would protect her or her community. That surprised me because of what I had heard from other uh, black people. And these were people I didn't even know that I was interviewing some of them. One, I just walked into the library and asked if, anybody, if any of y'all grew up here and did you know Sheriff Wyatt? And they began to tell me all these stories. And it wasn't that I had just the fear there in Greensboro, but when I moved to Decatur, Georgia, um, oh God, I was, you know, so country, naive person. Uh, I was, I'm in the big city now, and um, lo, lo and behold, um, not only, you know, that we have the police here, but we, I remember the big, um, KKK yes. rally we had out here <laughs> in front of this building, and um, I mean that was that was really something. I, I also tell, especially young people now, that did not happen a hundred years ago. You, I, I might look a hundred, but <laughs> more years before I'm a hundred. So, I, but I do remember that I believe the last big rally that the Klan's had on the square was probably in the early uh, 60s. Yeah. And they had um, the rally out here and they drove down through my neighborhood sitting on top of the cars mm. and all that craziness that they do yelling out and all of that, you know, trying to get. And I don't know, it was just something about that day is like enough is enough. And I'm not afraid of you anymore. Good. So some of my neighbors and I, we left Robin Street and walked up here on this corner. It was a huddle house. And so we could hear what they were saying. And if it was different than, than what they had yelled riding through the neighborhood. And I just thought one day, one day it's not going to be this that all mm -hmm. of the children that's growing up should not have to grow up in fear of the police. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be here to help you. And um, one of the things that um, happened when I, I'm gonna move forward a little bit on this, when I, became, when I was elected 
one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we had, one is that we had some African American on the police force, mm -hmm. and we ended up having a chief of the Cato Police Department who was African American. And so the attitude of, that I believe has changed, at least I can see it in the, in the metro area and especially in the city of Decatur, that the police force here is truly for me a community police force. Now I know if I call, they know who I am and they, they respond, but I don't want that. I want them to, if, if you call, I want them to respond the same way. Absolutely, and, and, and just community policing is really important. Uh, we were talking about that with Wyatt too, that he seemed to, you know, I guess down in Greene County, that was something he tried to do, but up here in Decatur, the cops, in the, okay, yeah, the, the cops in the uh, city of Decatur, they believe in community policing. Now that's like a big thing, knowing the people in your community is really important. You guys, that concludes our discussion. I can't give any more time because I want you to see a video that the Cap History Center has created. And it's pretty much a promo piece of Miss Wilson and Mrs. Hertzler. And I want you guys to see it. And that's going to conclude our program. Uh, thank you so much. I wish we could go on and on, but I'm, I'm trying to stick to time. So <laughs> let me uh, show this video. But the books are for sale in the back. Oh, I'm going to announce all of that. This video is only six minutes, so i, I got to conclude. Uh, but we are going to see this, and I'm going to announce the post. Which should we move? Tiffany, could I just make one more little announcement for you, so that, that when you see this, the real like shack, that's my one room schoolhouse. And I just want you to know that if I didn't have enough things that I was doing in my life, <laughs> all of a sudden I decided with the help of somebody from Georgia State University said that he would like to help rebuild the brand. <laughs> Before we conclude, let me just tell everyone that Ms. Hurstler will be personally selling and signing her books after the program. So she'll be signing her book at the books at the back table. And let me tell you, I've read it and it was so interesting. And I want to, um, I, I do recommend you guys purchase a book. It's a really good, nice slice of Georgia history. Um, also, I want to personally thank Mrs. Uh, Wilson and Mrs. Hurstler for spending time with me and educating me and inspiring me and being excellent examples of strong, vibrant, well-accomplished women. Thank you. <laughs> yes. And I do have something for you guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. programs, please consider joining our organization. Uh, this concludes our program, and thank you guys so much for a great, terrific evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.